Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome everyone to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. It is July 18th, 2017. I am your host, Chris Martinson. The Federal Reserve is both harming people today and saddling the future with extraordinary risks. Now, as you know, that's been our view here at Peak Prosperity for many years, starting with Greenspan, through Bernanke, and now into Yellen. Now, on June 28th of 2017, the United States Congress held a hearing entitled The Federal Reserve's Impact on Main Street Retirees and Savings. As you know, this is something we've been following uh, those impacts for, for years, and I was so excited to see this particular hearing come forward. So we followed and we featured this live discussion as it unfolded under our featured discussion section at the site. One of the invited experts that gave testimony was Alex J. Pollock, and he's today's guest for this program. You know, what I found fascinating about the hearing was that out of the four experts that had been impaneled, three of them might as well have been regular readers of ours over the years, or perhaps you'd think we've been learning from them. Either way, our views are no longer fringe, but held by three out of four financial experts brought in to testify, and it seems like common sense. Actions have consequences. The Fed's actions have had enormous consequences, and it's good to see them publicly aired finally. So we'll get into this in more detail, but the synthesis is that the Fed's policies have badly hurt savers, Main Street, and retirees, while transferring those losses over to the financial system to become its gains. I was particularly taken by the clear, level-headed, fact-based testimony of Alex J. Pollock. Alex is Distinguished Senior Fellow with the R Street Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan, public policy think tank. Alex joined R Street in January of 2016 from the American Enterprise Institute, where he was a resident fellow from 2004 to 2015. And he previously was president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. He also serves as a director of the CME Group, a director of the Great Lakes Higher Education Corp., and a director and past chairman of the Great Books Foundation, as well as many other board and service roles. He is also the author of Boom and Bust, Financial Cycles and Human Prosperity, published in 2011. Alex, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Let's begin, Alex, if we could, with your testimony to the Congressional Committee on the Financial Services Committee. This was on the Fed's impact on Main Street retirees and savings. First, set the stage for us. Uh, What was the purpose of the hearing? Who convened it? And uh, why did they call you in? This is a hearing uh, of a subcommittee on monetary policy uh, of the Financial Services Committee, which is the Committee of Jurisdiction uh, of the Federal Reserve and uh, and other things uh, financial. Uh, Long ago, that committee was known as the Committee on Banking and Currency, just to get its uh, link uh, to monetary affairs historically. And they were worried uh, about uh, what the Fed has been doing uh, over the last uh, number of years uh, to to, uh, distort financial markets, uh, to, uh, I was going to say rob, but I'll I'll say take money away uh, from savers and give it to other people. Uh, And in general, how, uh, what should the relationship be uh, between the Federal Reserve and its uh, creator, uh, and overseer the Congress of the United States, uh, which is a contentious uh, issue, as you know, because the Fed uh, uh, believes and uh, is fond of strongly promoting the idea that it should be independent, that is, it should just be able to do whatever it wants. Uh, and this, I think, is a very healthy um, uh, reaction from the Congress in saying, well, we would really like to understand uh, what Federal Reserve, you are doing, and make it be clear uh, that the um, uh, no matter how exalted uh, 
an organization may be or think it is, where they are all all parts of the government are responsible to the elected representatives of the people, that is to say, the Congress. And as I said, that seems to me a very healthy development. Now, people in the United States believe that, and we're told this all the time, that we operate under a democratic form of government. Several of the hallmarks of democracy include free and fair elections, you've got uh, basic protections of rights, uh, majority rule, open citizen participation. But one of those core tenets of a democracy is the right to either serve in the public interest or to vote in an elected representative. That is, accountability is supposed to be part of that equation. You've just touched on a really important part, which is, who is the Fed actually accountable to in this story? If you believe the story of people who believe in the independence of the Fed, as they say, they're not accountable to anybody except themselves. But that's, uh, as your comments suggest, clearly an undemocratic idea. Uh, they have to be and they should be accountable to the legislature. Uh, and how to how to make that accountability real is a is a very important and interesting problem we need to keep working on. The the opposite of uh, a democracy is, of course, rule by self-appointed philosopher kings. Uh, philosopher kings are antithetical to the American tradition and to the proper American political philosophy, and we shouldn't have philosopher kings in the Federal Reserve any more than we have them anyplace else. Well, yes. Here, here's where this gets a, a little bit tricky. So I wanted, I, I will get back to the testimony. I really want to dive into the impacts that have been recorded on uh, Main Street retiree savers, all of that. But it was a number of years ago that Bloomberg markets ha had to go in through FOIA uh, requests and really pry out of the Federal Reserve some documents to say, hey, what were you doing there during the height of this panic and, and in the years afterwards? And, and they got, I don't know, 29,000 pages of documents out of them. But it turned out that $7.77 .77 trillion had been loaned out to a variety of organizations, including foreign central banks, U.S. banks, foreign banks, you name it. Uh, and at the height of the, uh, of the crisis in December 5th, 2008, $1.2 trillion was out the door at below market rates. Doesn't that seem like something that, that uh, the public should have at least some insight into? And, and if not, tell me, I don't understand the argument of the people who say, no, no, that's private. That should be, um, you know, for the Fed to have the independence it needs. It needs to be able to funnel up to $1.2 trillion out in the dead of night to whoever it wants to. Nobody should be able to see that. How do, how do you, can you help me understand the argument that says there's, there's, um, there's no way that there, there's going to be any... Uh, possibility for, um, let's just say, um, malfeasance to occur in that in, in, in such a moment? Well, I can't, I cannot help you understand the argument that the public should not be aware and the elected representatives of the public, uh, what the Fed has done and what's going on. Uh, that just seems to be, uh, to me, to be fundamental. Mm-hmm. Well, it's uh, certainly fundamental from, from the standpoint of transparency, of understanding. These are public monies we're talking about. So let's circle back. I thought at, at that hearing, from what I watched, I thought several of the attending congressmen and congresswomen asked really good questions, uh, you know, even, even more than I, 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 was, I was pleasantly surprised. Did you think so? Yes, I did. And, uh, and I can tell you that, at least for me, none of those questions was planted. Really? <laughs> so, where did those questions come from? That's fantastic because they were really good questions. They really were. I I thought so, and I, and I thought they I thought the uh, uh, the members of the subcommittee were serious, had thought about it, and um, uh, and done some studying of the issue. And of course, these are just hugely important issues. There's nothing that's more. Uh, ubiquitous in any society than money. Uh, they, uh, a hundred and some years ago, they used to call the nature of money about which they had great debates, let's say in the days of uh, William Jennings Bryan and William McKinley, the money question. And the money question it continues to be huge because 
if you're if you're changing the nature of money and manipulating interest rates and manipulating financial markets, you are touching virtually everybody in the society. And so uh, that's the basic uh, activity that's going on with the Federal Reserve, and it's a, it's a deeply and essentially political question, in addition to being a financial and economic question. I might even throw in a sociological question because we saw three years ago, I think it was 2015, that uh, 62 people had as much wealth as half the world. And then in 2016, I think that dropped to eight, and now the number's down to five. So, so, so what's happening here is the, the central banks in total, not just to pick on the Federal Reserve, but collectively have printed around $33 trillion into the maw of this crisis, kept that printing going up. And of course, it's creating uh, large wealth and income gaps, which is really a, has a political dimension. It's also a sociological question. Uh, but isn't it, this to me seems like a very ripe area f- to have v- thoughtful, we should be debating the money question because uh, these are really big impacts, but the Federal Reserve wants to conduct these experiments. I'm not aware that they have the expertise of either the political or the sociological dimension on board, and yet they are allowed to fully just run these experiments. Is this really, uh, this hearing, was this starting to nudge towards that idea of saying, hey, maybe we should have more public oversight of something this central? It's not, money isn't like, you know, we're, we're fiddling with wheat prices. We're fiddling with the price of everything that feels pretty central to me was that sort of the thrust of this or am i missing it money is the price of everything and of course interest rates are the price of money in the future uh we now have uh, in the choice act which has been passed by the house of representatives uh, a bill which has a title in it uh, on federal reserve reform uh, which suggests and the way i think about this is uh, serious and grown-up conversations uh, between the Federal Reserve and the responsible uh, committees in Congress about what is really going on, what theories are being applied here, what are alternative ways to think about them, what are the risks, what are the uncertainties, just the way you would, let's say, in the management committee of a company to debate what you're trying to do. Uh, and that this uh, hearing we're discussing uh, was a, a step in that direction. I, I hope we can take more steps uh, as time goes on. Now, Alex, in that, uh, I, I'm looking at your testimony here, and, and I'll jump to you started. I, I love you did this. You started with your conclusion, which is Congress should require a savers impact analysis from the Federal Reserve at each discussion of the Fed's policies and plans with the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, that seems very um, uh, a very measured and also a very reasonable step that that the Fed should consider the impacts of its policies on on everyone, not just say the banking system. Uh, so, can well, you talk to can you talk to us about that a little bit? Yes. Well, we we know that uh, for long term growth uh, of the society, but also for the uh, well being of individuals and families, we have to have saving and that long periods uh, such as we've had in which the Federal Reserve manipulates uh, real interest rates by by which we mean of course interest rates minus the inflation rate uh, uh, it manipulates real interest rates to be less than zero is punishing savers it means if you save a hundred dollars it's worth 99. Uh, at the end of the year. So how can it be that the this uh, key function and idea, economic, uh, uh, political, sociological uh, idea of savings doesn't get uh, the full attention about what is happening? So in general, I think um, uh, he would be right to say in, in trying to think about what um, uh, what they, what the Fed calls monetary policy, or what we could call monetary manipulation, or monetary experimentation, to use the term you did, uh, what is it doing to various important parts of the of the uh, of the society and the economy? In and 
what about always remembering savers? That seems to me to be an idea that is actually impossible to argue with, but but it isn't done. So uh, my my proposal is that the Fed, as it comes up uh, to the Congress, to have what we would hope for as a uh, a grown-up, serious, substantive discussion about what's going on would always, in, in addition to everything else it's saying, be talking about what is this policy doing uh, uh, for or against savings uh, and to savers. Now, the Fed's been conducting this negative real interest rate policy for a number of years. You were at the committee. Eight, eight you, years. Eight, eight very long years from my perspective. And... Uh, if you were going to summarize the the other testimony you heard, what ha- what what what's what is the punchline? What has the impact on Main Street retirees and savings been of those eight years? Well, it's been highly negative. You have negative real interest rates. That is a negative uh, impact on savings and especially on conservative savers. Now, um, I want to come back to something you said before, which is the crisis. All right, there's the period of the crisis. In the period of the crisis, there's extreme uncertainty, and there is uh, experimentation and bailouts uh, going on. Um, We can always argue about what was the right way to do it, but that always happens in every crisis. Uh, There's always government intervention uh, uh, and experimentation. That's, that's just an empirical law of the behavior of governments. All right, so, but now let's say the crisis is over. When did the crisis end in the United States? And the answer is in the uh, second quarter of 2009. 2009, that's eight years ago. So why, the question that I like to think about is, so why, eight years later, have we still got uh, this Federal Reserve manipulation going on? Uh, and in particular, why are we still taking money away from savers uh, to give to borrowers? Now, of course, there are all kinds of borrowers, but let me mention two of them in particular. So let's start with the saver. So the saver has hard-earned savings prudently laid up uh, to to provide for emergencies and to provide for the future. And uh, let's say the interest rate has been something like 0.3%, something trivial, thanks to the Fed. Meanwhile, the Fed is trying to engineer annual inflation of 2% and has uh, publicly announced its plan is to have perpetual inflation, 2% forever, so if we're inflating it too and we're getting 0.3, the value of our savings is going down at 1.7% per year as long as this has been going on, and it's been going on eight years after the crisis ended. Okay, on the other side, that's an advantage to various kinds of borrowers. Some of them are ordinary people, but some of them are highly leveraged speculators. There's no... Nobody, with one exception, which I'll come to, who gets more advantage out of negative interest rates than than people with a lot of debt uh, speculating in financial markets. And that makes it uh, much more profitable to carry on their activities. Now, the one exception is the government itself. That's an even bigger beneficiary because if the government wants to run big deficits, how can the Fed help it out? Well, how about by making the real interest rate you have to pay as the government to run your deficits negative? So one of the things the Fed is doing by this policy is trying to, uh, uh, trying to and succeeding in letting the government run its deficits and keeping the cost of those deficits down on the back of the savers. So what we have going on here is a huge transfer of wealth from savers uh, to borrowers. And the big we know who the biggest borrower is, it's the government itself. Yeah, this gets right to the heart of, of my critique and criticism of Fed policy over many years, which is I don't happen to believe 
These are my beliefs. I'll put them on the table. I don't, I don't believe you can print your way to prosperity. Uh, every time this has been attempted in all of history, all we see were temporary booms supported by overly abundant and even mispriced money. The resulting gains, as you've just described, are unevenly distributed. One sector loses, another gains. Speculators win, as you say. The middle class loses, mostly. So seen in this way, the Federal Reserve is, is not a prosperity-creating institution like they like to paint themselves, but a, a redistribution machine that would probably make Karl Marx blush. Uh, is that too harsh? <laughs> Uh, I think I think among its very important effects are precisely redistribution. Now, now one of the uh, one of the congressmen present at this hearing was a Democratic congressman, uh, a friend of mine. He started off his opening comment saying, "I think we need to think about the distributive or redistributive effects of Federal Reserve policy," and then he left, as they often, as members of Congress often do in hearings, they can go in and out. And I said I was so glad to hear Congressman Foster say that because that's precisely what I want to talk about, the redistribution by the Federal Reserve from savers to other people. And uh, as you know, I went ahead and put a number on what I believe that redistribution has been, which is $2.4 trillion since 2008. $2.4 trillion. Is that just lost interest or is there another component to that? That is the uh, negative real interest rate. So we take uh, what we estimate as all of the individual savings there are in different forms, CDs, treasury bills owned by individuals, uh, money market fund shares, savings deposits, uh, and we calculate the uh, interest rate received minus the inflation rate, the depreciation of the currency by the inflation rate. That gets us the negative real interest rate. Then we compare that to what would have happened if you had had positive real interest rates on such savings equal to the 50-year average of the period before, that is to say 1958 uh, to 2007. And that gap between the 50-year average positive real interest rate, which is 1.66%, and the actual negative real interest rate, which is received, we multiply that gap times the total amount of savings, we get the transfer or the loss to savers, $2.4 trillion. Alex, so let me talk laid about out it. Keep going. Uh, I just I laid, I laid out all this math in my testimony. There's a year-by-year -year calculation so if somebody doesn't like this or that uh, assumption, they, they can change it. But it's not going to change the fundamental conclusion. Right. And so, so let, let's take the implication of that conclusion. You know, there was some uh, millionaire real estate investor recently had chided millennials because they weren't buying houses because he said they ate too much avocado toast, you know, or something like that. But, but traditionally savers, which might be parents and grandparents, had gotten that interest income. You're, you're, you've identified $2.4 missing trillion dollars. And that would ordinarily be there as the capital stock of a family, which might go into new business formation and the enterprises that have, have been typically the, the lifeblood of, of the growth and jobs and prosperity engine of the United States. And then you wander over to the Census Bureau data and they say, wow, look, new business formation is really just like just just plummeting and we don't understand why. And I think I'm way over here waving my hand. I think I do. I think there's a couple missing trillion dollars that's not available to the traditional stock of savers, grandparents, parents, all of that to help to begin to uh, uh, raise up and, and, and seed, put, provide seed capital to the next generation. So the real impacts to this and I think that's true or helping the, as is traditional, helping the children buy houses. Yes. Now, there's another problem of buying houses, which the prices of houses, thanks very importantly to the Fed, are now again off the chart. The, the nominal price of houses on average in the United States is now higher, now this is in nominal terms, are now higher than they were at the peak of the bubble in 2006. Why is that? It's because the Fed has artificially suppressed interest rates, well, uh, hurting savers, you might say, well, look how wonderful it is 
uh, for somebody getting a mortgage, they get a lower rate, but they're also paying a much higher price for the house. So we're pushing the price of houses out of the reach of these very young people you were referring to a moment ago by this same uh, Federal Reserve policy. Now they set out very consciously uh, to create uh, a boom, a renewed boom in house prices. In economists speak, they call it a wealth effect. We make the price of assets go up. Uh, well, that was arguable maybe in 2012, which was the bottom of U.S. house prices. But this is 2017, five years later. They're still at it. House prices are over their peak in nominal terms and very high in real terms. Why are they still at it? Uh, that's a sort of question that needs to be seriously discussed with them. Well, it certainly does. But if we could speculate for a minute, um, my view is that uh, they started out in these uh, highly interventionist programs. They created markets that, that uh, require continuous propping in order to remain elevated. Uh, I think we had a couple of, of, of beginnings of, of minor corrections. We had one in 2011, one in 12, one in 14, another one in early January 2016. Each of those was met with a brand new wall of either QE money directly or enhanced printing by a foreign central bank, either Bank of Japan or Bank of uh, European Central Bank. So it, there's been this constant effort to keep everything just going and growing. And I, can, I think I could sort of understand that policy if you said, well, we're going to do this until growth comes back. But you wander with me over to the GDP growth numbers. They're all anemic. If you look at economists who understand the role of debt and also unfunded liabilities as a drag on future growth, all we've gotten is a massive pile of new unfunded liabilities and the record amounts of debt on corporate balance sheets, sovereign balance sheets, public, private, you name it. It's all over the place. And we still don't have the growth to show for it. Do you think, Alex, are the central banks, have they, is, is there a way out of this for them that uh, allows them to save face and isn't too painful for everybody? They're in a tough spot, I think, uh, especially with their, uh, uh, their, their bond and mortgage investments. Let's take, the, this is true of the, all of the major central banks. Uh, I'll include Switzerland among major central banks because mm -hmm. of their uh, they're highly uh, uh, interesting country in currency. Uh, Swiss Central Bank, as you know, is buying American stocks mm -hmm. on the balance sheet of the, of the central bank, uh, among a lot of other things. But in the Fed, they're buying long-term bonds and long-term fixed-rate mortgages. This has led me to say in print, the Federal Reserve has made itself into the biggest savings and loan in the world. The, the savings and loans collapsed, as we'll recall, from buying long-term fixed-rate mortgages and funding them with floating-rate liabilities. Well, that's exactly what the Federal Reserve does today. Now, they did this to, to drive the, the market prices of those securities of, of mortgage-backed securities, and that is to say of mortgages and of long-term treasuries. They wanted to drive their prices higher. That is to say, they wanted to make the interest rates lower, and they wanted all that to make house prices higher, and they wanted it to make to make it cheaper to fund the big government deficits. Well, so you you bought a big enough position to move the market up, and now you've got this huge position, uh, one point eight trillion uh, mortgages and two and a half trillion of long-term uh, government bonds. And now you say you'd like to normalize, as the phrase is, and get out of it. But if the position was big enough to drive the market up when you bought it, it's very hard to imagine how you can get out of it without driving the market down. But they don't want to drive the market down. So there's their dilemma. Well, the, the concern might be that it's not just drive it down, but it, it may well uh, go very far down and then they'll lose all of their wealth effect. But then I think more importantly, they would have to admit a certain amount of defeat saying, wow, we pumped everything up and all we got was this T-shirt. Yeah, know? <laughs> right? of course. Now, how, you know, how could I possibly play the role of the infallible oracle if it was obvious that my, my uh, strategy in the end 
uh, didn't work. Right. And, and so we, here we are at this at this really interesting critical juncture. But it, it's astonishing to me that uh, that the, the damage actually to pensions, uh, just astonishing damage to pensions by this, uh, the nominal as well as the real rates of interest, astonishing damage to savers, all of that. We're just starting to have that Look conversation it. now. Um, pensions are just saving. Pensions are just a, a, a pooled form of savings. So when you're damaging savers, you're and in, in, in our calculation, we didn't even count the effect on, on pensions, which, as I say, are savings. Mm. So this has all been, it's really clearly a, a, a very, very large issue. When, when Janet Yellen most recently gave speeches, I saw her say that, washed her hands, said, no, no, the Fed's not responsible for wealth gaps or income inequality. That, that, that wasn't us. Of course, it, obviously, it totally is. Uh, a direct feature of, of their program. And people wrote about that, including myself, years ago. But here we are. Um, do you think, tell me about your, your sense of the political appetite to maybe really begin to uh, do things like audit the Fed. And if you could explain for people what that actually means, because I think there's been a lot of very poor ink wasted on it and, and, and some very poor descriptions of what that really means. Um, mostly it feels like PR to help preserve the air quote independence uh, of the Fed. But, uh, you know, and you had a 2005 uh, Wall Street Journal editorial. It was entitled, It's High Time to Audit the Federal Reserve. Um, I did. <laughs> yes. And I tried to explain that by audit, it, it, audit the Fed may not be the happiest uh, turn of phrase picked for this. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean go in and, and tick the boxes uh, and, and ask whether the assets uh, equal the liabilities. It means uh, uh, seriously review by the Congress what the Fed is doing, why it's doing it, what the trade-offs are, what the distributional effects are, uh, what the uncertainties are, and what would make sense going forward. Mm -hmm. So you probably a, a better term than, than audit the Fed would be make the Fed accountable. Hmm. And so talk about that accountability. What, how, what would happen? Accountability usually means there's some form of consequence if, if something goes awry. How would accountability actually apply here, do you think? Well, in, the, in a, uh, a basic sense, we are coming back to one of the most fundamental uh, um, items in the of political philosophy which gave birth to the American Constitution, and that is checks and balances. That no, uh, uh, nobody is the thought, and the thought is correct. Uh, nobody can be trusted with unchecked power. Everybody, uh, no matter how well-intentioned they might be, uh, should be subject to review and checks and balances by by others. Uh, that's as fundamental a principle of governance as you can get in a principle of politics. So uh, I just apply that to the Federal Reserve. It should also be in a system of checks and balances, in a system uh, of review uh, uh, by the Congress. And what punishment could you have? Well, I, I th I'm focused less on punishment than on uh, exploration of the ideas, the effects, uh, of discovering and admitting mistakes when they're making, which is a fundamental principle of human life, uh, and uh, in, in being uh, enmeshed in a, a system where other people are looking, criticizing, reviewing, evaluating uh, what you're doing. Now, this is something I would highly support because uh, I recently wrote an article called uh, Bad Models, Worse Outcomes. I think the, the Fed has running models that don't make any sense. And I think that if we could critically have a dialogue around that, I think that it would be a, a wonderful debate. And they should have to defend these crazy models. So one of them, I think that they're holding out, I think the Fed's become highly interventionist. And by the way, in full disclosure, my grandfather sat on the New York Federal Reserve. Um, he was a regional bank president at the time. He was under Paul Volcker at that, at that moment. 
So I had a little sort of an insight in, into how this all worked, but my grandfather would not recognize what the Fed has become. Uh, you know, and if I would characterize their bad model, at least on one component, it seems to me that they believe they're in charge of assuring that we don't have busts after booms. It's just booms from now on. Seems rather misguided. It's not well grounded in history. In other words, we have to believe that this time is different, that these people in charge of the Fed now are going to do something that no humans have managed before, which is to eliminate the business cycle. And of course, they failed in 2000, they failed in 2007. And here we are with not just a housing bubble, but I think we've got what I call the mother of all bubbles. This is everything. This is the everything bubble. It's got it's, it's like the everything bagel. It's got everything. Uh, it's, so it's, it's certainly a bubble in uh, bonds and stocks uh, and houses and not to be forgotten commercial real estate. Across all that and across every sector in bonds, junk bonds, in Europe trading with it under 3%, crazy, right? So here we are. Um, but that seems to be their model, which is, oh, we figured out how to eliminate the business cycle. Uh, your thoughts on that? Is that a, have they done it? That's a phrase uh, that uh, has been popular for a long time. The mistakes go far back uh, beyond the years you mentioned. They go back to let's say, at least the post-World War I uh, uh, inflation uh, uh, in 1920 or so, followed by a big bust then. Uh, and often since then, the, uh, the Fed, uh, like anybody else, is sometimes right and sometimes wrong, and sometimes disastrously wrong. Uh, they, uh, it got to be a very popular saying in the 1960s, the heyday of belief in uh, Keynesian economy, that the, the macroeconomists would come to Washington and advise the government, and they would, do you remember this phrase, fine-tune, quote, fine-tune the economy. Mm -hmm. And they actually seriously talked about doing away with uh, business cycles and crises, and then we had terrific cycles and financial crises in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s. And when you count the uh, European sovereign debt crisis, 2010s. Uh, so the cycles are not going away, and the central bankers don't know um, don't know how to make them go away. Um, and, and the problem is that the uh, because the future is inherently uncertain and unknowable. Uh, when, when you do extreme and experimental things, uh, you very often get results that you not only didn't intend, but had no way of expecting. Uh, and that can surely happen with central banking and the money question. Now, one of the things I think the Federal Reserve has done uh, by driving interest rates will start in the early 1980s um, from, say, 14% on the long end on down to where we are at 1.8% at or from you know 7% on the short down to wherever we are, uh, zero, essentially. Now, I guess we're hovering around 1% right now. So I, look, everybody's familiar with this number, the national debt of the United States, around 20 trillion. Unthinkable number just 10 years ago, but here we are. But if you look at the total underfunded liabilities plus the debts of the U.S., which includes corporate household, all of that, uh, Bridgewater Associates, uh, Ray Dalio's organization, put together this chart and said, compared to GDP, what are the total IOUs of the United States? And the answer is they've just been going up steadily with little dips and wiggles, but pretty much steadily since the time uh, we've been dropping rates. And we're down here at the zero bound. But the punchline is this, Alex, we're at 1,100%. IOUs to GDP. No country's ever been here before. How do we even begin to approach a number like that? What are the options that are available to begin to wrestle with uh, something like that, which to me looks so large? I, I only have one question floating in my head, which is who's going to eat those losses? But what are your thoughts there? Well, we know uh, that when debt gets very large relative to incomes, there typically are losses. Uh, as you say, uh, and the uh, the first questions that arise after any big correction is precisely who is going to get the losses. So there is a zero-sum game that goes on, like in a bankruptcy uh, debt reorganization, 
We know there are big losses. Consider Puerto Rico today, for example. There are big losses. Everybody can't be paid. Uh, but who is going to take what kind of losses? Who's going to get a 40% haircut? Who's going to get a 60% haircut? Who's going to get an 80% haircut? And so the great uh, debate becomes uh, about who, who gets the losses. Now, one of the things, as, as we've been talking about, that happened after uh, after the last uh, uh, bust, uh, 2007 to 2009, is losses are, of course, distributed. Uh, and a big bunch of the losses through the Fed has been put on savers in exactly the way we've been discussing. Or I guess whoever's on the other side of those IOUs uh, will certainly take it. I just, for my uh, life of me, I, I have not been able to figure out how you get around a, a, a debt load. That There's no historical example that says here's how it's been done before. We had England get out from a 260% debt to GDP load. That was from uh, the period of 1815 to 1900. Hey, they dismantled the Napoleonic War machinery. Hey, they had this thing called the Industrial Revolution, a couple nice tailwinds. They did it, but nobody's been here before. And and I haven't found anybody who can have a substantive discussion around this. I, I talked with Bradley Belt, um, former uh, executive director of, of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corps, and his only he just throws he shrugs his shoulders and says, rapid growth. We have to have rapid economic growth. That's the plan. And and what I'm interested in in, in how this By hearing the way, that's rapid real when you say that, that means rapid real growth. Correct. Not, right. not, not just nominal growth. Rapid real growth. Yeah, that means you have to have productivity, and productivity means you have to have uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, investment, and savings. Uh, there is something else you can do. You know, you can have a currency reform, uh, like in Germany in 1922 or 23, when you got one new mark for 10 billion old ones. Well, then we're so. just then we're just answering the question: the who's eating light, the losses? You know, <laughs> who gets the losses? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So if um, you were suddenly made, you know, the, the self-appointed philosopher king in charge at this moment in history, what would you begin to do to right this ship? Uh, first of all, I don't accept the job as philosopher king. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> I, so they can't exist in, in principle. Uh, not me or anybody else. Uh, it's uh, look. This is the result of decades of development, um, uh, and we uh, uh, will take decades of development uh, to address it. On the other hand, uh, enterprising economies and enterprising societies have an amazing history of coming through incredible challenges of various kinds uh, and keeping the growth going. That's the good news. I, ha I'm, uh, I have just finished writing a, a book which is called Finance and Philosophy, by the way, at least that's the tentative title. Mm -hmm. And it has a chapter called Wonderful Trend and Troublesome Cycle. And, and there is an incredible long-term 200-year-old trend uh, of growth and increasing well-being for ordinary people like you and me uh, and enterprising societies uh, can keep that trend going, but you've got to have enterprise, innovation, science, entrepreneurship, savings, and the rule of law. So I guess that would be the list I would start with, and then, then I'd work from there. Well, clearly a lot of things on that list uh, would need tweaking at best uh, at this point. So um, with that, I'm really looking forward to seeing that new book come out, Alex. I want to thank you so much uh, for your time today. We are out of time at this moment for this interview, but uh, please tell people how they can continue to follow your work. Thank you. I'm, uh, I am a uh, fellow of the R Street Institute, and there's a page on the R Street Institute webpage that's me, uh, it's www.rstreet, the letter R and the word street written together, dot org slash people slash Alex hyphen J hyphen Pollock, P-O-L-L-O-C-K, and that's my page, and it has everything uh, that I have written uh, since uh, the beginning of 2016, and there's a lot on the Fed, 
uh, and related uh, topics on there. And uh, if you'd like to take a look, that would be great. And uh, if any of the listeners uh, uh, feel inspired uh, to write me about anything uh, they see there, my email is there, and I'd love to hear from you. Well, thank you very much. We'll put that direct link right under this podcast at our site. Thank you so much for uh, the work you've been doing. Thank you for bringing your message and uh, what I think is a message of common sense and uh, very badly needed to Congress. And uh, please, all the best and, and have, have wonderful success in helping to bring some accountability to the Fed. That would be a wonderful, wonderful addition at this part of history. Thank you very much. We're going to keep working on it. And I thank you again for having me on your podcast. It's really been great to be together with you. Thank you.